Welcome everyone to our A to J Author new user webinar for May. This is Jessica Frank. I'm A to J Author's project manager. Today we're going to be talking about jazzing up your A to J guided interviews. So it's talking about how to make them next level by using macros, functions, learn mores, and pop-ups. This is really about moving beyond basic interview question design and making your interviews feel like they're speaking directly to the end user. So making the, end view, the interviews easier for the self-represented litigant to use, doing some of the calculation work for them, and providing them with additional legal information or help just in time, that is just at the point in which they need it in the interview. Every month I like to do a tips and tricks section just to talk about things that have come up over the past month in my interactions with authors. Um, and one of the ones that has come up is that the need for authors to regularly review their content. So we had a big sort of culling of the old interviews when Flash went away uh, over a year ago. And so all of the old interviews, we had a, a ton that were created in like 2009, 2010, 2011, um, but they were made in the old version of A to J authors. So they, when Flash eventually was deprecated off the internet, um, they went away. A lot of those interviews have moved and authors have converted them into the web-based version of A to J author, um, which is what you have access to now but it's still important to regularly review your content. So once a year, we recommend you at least go through your interview again, make sure that all of the paths still work, spend a couple of hours just testing your interview, making sure that the document it produces, whether it's in the A to J document assembly tool, the DAT, or in Hot Docs or your own case management system, wherever the ultimate end document comes out of, um, make sure that it is still looking like it's supposed to, that it is still legally relevant, Make sure any of the logic or assumptions that you have built into your interview are still valid. So if you have logic that has a calculation based off of you know, $45,000, make sure that that number is still relevant and still what you want going forward. This is also important if you self-host your A to J interviews. So if you use this, the A to J viewer on your own servers, that you regularly update your viewer. We have it now on a GitHub. You can subscribe to the GitHub repository and get updates when we do code pushes. But it's important for security reasons to make sure that you keep your A to J viewer updated. Um, we have some that are multiple years old and that we've reached out to all of the self-hosters that we, um, we know about and we interact with to make sure that they remember to regularly update. But goes with your content or your viewer files or your DAT files, make sure to update that stuff uh, whenever possible or whenever uh, it comes out and at least check it once a year. So on our agenda today, we're going to talk about four specific tools that you can use in A to J Author to take your interview to the next level. So we'll talk about variable macros, learn mores, pop-ups, and functions. So the first one up is variable macros. Variable macros are a way to call up the value of a variable in a question text, in learn more prompts and responses, in field labels, radio buttons, and signposts. It's a way to use the information an end user has already told you, like their name in the example in the screenshot, and display it back to them. It makes the end user feel like you're talking to them specifically, and it can also be used to remind them of information they've given you in prior questions. So this one, when you personalize it with a name, um, shows and makes it feel like you are talking to them specifically, and um, it helps the end user connect with the interview more than just a static piece of paper or a static series of questions. Here's how you format the macro to display the var variable's value. It's double percent signs, open the bracket, variable name, close the bracket, double percent signs. Anywhere you use this format, A to J author is going to know to pull out the value of that variable um, and display it. Here it's showing it displayed in uh, the question text, but I'll show you different ways that you can use it moving forward. And here's where you can use variable macros. So in the question text itself, in the learn more prompt, which is the question the end user thinks, in the learn more response, which is the response the guide avatar gives to that question, radio buttons, field labels, and signposts. Most commonly, a macro is used in question text to recall a name the end user has told you. It's a really easy way for you as authors to make your interview look professional and next level. I always tell my students when they are uh, creating guided interviews that this is such an easy trick and it will really take your interview to that next level. It looks custom. Um, it looks again like they're like you're talking to the end user and it is such a simple uh, programming trick to throw that in there that every time your interviews run, th that person is engaged with your interview. 
Another example of this would be in a repeat loop where you ask for the user's child's name and then you have a follow-up question or a series of follow-up questions about that child. So use the child's name instead of asking what is your child's name and then what's your child's date of birth, where is their school, um, who is your child's father, just use the name they've already given you. So it should say what is Sally's birth date, what is Christopher's birth date, where is Allison's school. That reminds the end user of which child you're talking about. So in a repeat loop, you're potentially asking about multiple children. So remind them which iteration of the loop they're on. And it also makes the interview custom to that end user. Variable macros can be used in learn more prompts. So the thought the end user avatar has as shown here. So why would I want the name of the person they had given me as they want to be their agent? So why would I want Jane Doe to be my children's guardian too? And in the learn more, you can explain why it's good to have uh, the agent be the guardian as well. This is the response. So here's the response to the question of why would I want variable macro of agent's name to be my children's guardian. Um, and th then you can add in that name again to the answer. So you're already trusting Jane Doe as your agent. If you think this person will also look after your children's interests, select them as their, your children's legal guardian. Keeps it clear um, who you're asking about and who they're answering about when you have this information. You can use a macro to personalize a radio button selection. So each time an end user sees this, it is customized to them specifically, which one of these people do you want to be your agent? Instead of saying agent one or agent two, you just use the names they've given you for those variables. You can use it for field labels as well. You can do more also than just uh, simply insert a name into an interview with a variable macro. So um, you can do it, as I mentioned, in a repeat loop to uh, help the end user remember which iteration of the loop they're on. You can display information collected in a loop to the end user to learn more. So um, you may be asking them for a list of their assets or a list of their debts or their monthly bills, and they're telling you one after another. And then at the end, you say, do you want to add any more? And you can have an inner uh, learn more that says, well, which ones have I told you about already? They click it, to, they click the learn more to see which ones and you use a variable macro to say, you've told me about your, um, your car payment, your mortgage, your uh, utilities bill, whatever they've put into that list collected in that variable of monthly bill TE um, can be displayed back to them uh, to remind them what they've already told you about. And you can use it to display the correct word. So instead of saying child slash children or is slash r or asset with the s in parentheses, you can determine how, with the end user how many there is. So is it one child or is it more than or is it multiple? And so it's children. Whatever that is, then you can set a new variable called child slash children uh, te to the, either the word child or the word children. And then every time you have to use that word, um, you can use a macro to call up the correct uh, iteration of that word. Same for is or are, um, asset, assets, whatever it is, you can determine if it's the singular or the plural to um, use of the word and then use that correct one in a variable macro going forward in the text. You've already seen the intro to learn more is in the macro section that I just showed you. I showed you a little bit about learn more uh, responses and learn more prompts. But let's talk more about what you can do with your interview through Learn Mores. Learn Mores are one of A to J Authors' just-in-time learning features that allows additional information just at the point, just in time, in the interview in which the end user needs it. So you've asked a question and you anticipate that the end user may have some difficulty answering it. So you put the additional information in a Learn More that is available to the end user if they need it. Here, what county do you live in? List of counties to pick from. The end user says, well, what if I don't know what county I live in? And then the learn more, if they don't know what county they live in, they can click learn more and up will pop, uh, you can look up your county based on your address here with an outlink to a website that can help them find whatever information it is that, that you are asking about. Learn mores can be text, so simple text um, with, a, with a link or just additional information. It can be a graphic. It can be a video or it can be some combination of all three of those. So this is just a silly video, but you can see that you can add um, maybe a video about how to, uh, to actually file in the courthouse. So, you know, where do you go to file it? Here's the clerk's office and here is the file, you know, the desk that you go to um, with the 
with the graphic here. So the question is something about asking them what their case number is, and their question is like, where do I find that information? So it's in the caption. Here's a picture of a typical caption. And then they, you could have like a big yellow arrow pointing to case number, and um, that explains to the end user where to find it. You add a learn more by scrolling down to the learn more information section of the question design editor. So in the pages tab, when you click on a, on a page uh, to edit it, the question design editor pops up and it's all about scrolling with that. And you scroll down to the learn more information section and you have then the prompt, which is what the end user thinks. It's the question that they pose, um, you pose because you come up with a beforehand, but it's the, the thought the guide app, the end user avatar has. And then there's the response, which is what the guide avatar answers that question with. It's important to note that a learn more will not display if there is not a prompt. So that is what triggers that learn more button to display to the end user. So you need some sort of question for the end user avatar to think um, before you can include any response for them. Our Learn More section has undergone a WCAG, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, compliance audit and um, upgrades in the summer of 2020. And we have additional fields for authors to increase the interview's accessibility. So these include things like a media label, is the media supplemental or duplicative? Uh, graphic alt text, so 100 characters or less that describes the image for a screen reader. Um, just a very simple, you know, in, in um, the image, like this is a, a legal document with the caption uh, highlighted or the caption, uh, the case number pointed out with a, with a yellow um, arrow. Something very short to the point that the screen reader can read to the end user if they aren't able to see the picture itself. And then we also think of things like video transcripts. So what does the video say um, word for word when you include videos like that, if there, are, if there is sound in the video? So all of that increases the accessibility of your interview and it allows you within a learn more to add additional information at the point at which the end user needs it. So the next next level tool to discuss is pop-ups. Pop-ups and learn mores are incredibly important and useful portions of A to J guided interviews. I looked at our statistics in, uh, in our analytics. In 2021, there were 613, 166 A to J guided interviews run. Out of those interviews, 270,130 Learn Mores were clicked and 196,896 pop-ups were opened, were clicked. So this shows that end users are using these features, that they are worthwhile additions to your interview. A lot of times uh, this work, at least in talking to authors in the past, it's, it is a bit of work to add definitions and pop-ups or to add multimedia content and learn mores. And authors wonder if people are actually clicking it and using it. They are. They're overwhelmingly clicking it. You know, half of the interviews um, that were run, somebody clicked a learn more or a pop-up. Not every interview has a learn more or a pop-up, so it's more likely that lots of times when interviews were run, if a learn more or a pop-up was available, it was clicked. Um, so your work as authors to add these details is not going unnoticed, and it is useful um, and to your end users. If you're curious about how your individual learn mores or pop-ups are being clicked, if people are actually using the content that you yourself are putting into your interviews, you can always run uh, and create a customized tab or a customized report on the analytics tab of your interview. So you go to your A to J author account, you go to your interview, the analytics tab, and you can click here to request a custom analytics report um, for each of your individual interviews. You click this, it goes to us, Tobias uh, and Trejo, our backend developer, makes a custom uh, A to J analytics report. And then after about 48 hours, your, uh, your custom report will display here. And you can come back to this tab whenever you want and run and see updated data about your report. And it will include your learn mores clicked and your pop-ups clicked as well. Um, so that's important information that you yourself can generate relatively easily and quickly. All right, so talking about pop-ups. Pop-ups are another one of those just-in-time learning features that allow you to add definitions when you just have to use the legal term. So sometimes there isn't a way to translate a question further into plain language. You just have to use that legally relevant term. So are you the petitioner or the respondent? It matters which one they pick, and it is legally relevant which one it is. 
um, when this happens, when you have to ask the end user that legalese, you can add a definition that they can click on if they need the explanation of who a petitioner is or who a respondent is. You can add a pop-up by clicking the new pop-up button um, right here at the top of the pages tab. You just click new pop-up, it'll pop, it'll show up at the bottom of that tab um, and you'll be able to edit it. When you click on it, you could edit the name, the text, add audio, and I'll show you a couple of new things that you can add as well to your pop-up. The main focus in a pop-up is generally text. But um, if we keep scrolling, these are all the additions now to our pop-ups tab. So similar to the learn more section where you can add in uh, audio, graphics, or video in addition to plain text, we did a small grant with Lone Star Legal Aid Thank you to them um, in March, which allowed us to add all of the features of a Learn More to pop ups themselves and uh, all of the WCAG, the, that Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, all that accessibility um, features that are in a Learn More are also now in pop ups as well. So then when you are ready to add the pop-up, so you've created the pop-up and now you're ready to add it to your question text, you go into the question design editor, you highlight the word that you want, to word or words as here, you click the P icon, it brings up the list of available pop-ups, you select the one you want, you click change, and then you can preview it uh, here, and then you can see how your pop-up here is showing one of the new graphics included. Um, in pop-ups now. So uh, yeah, videos available in pop-ups, graphics are available in pop-ups, or you can have just plain text, which is the more common usage, but all of it is available to you to use with your end users. There is a sample exercise that I created to help you practice your pop-up skills. So you can either go to adagiauthor.org under the learn tab and go to the sample exercises and scroll down to the one that's about pop-ups, or you can follow this link here on the screen, adajauthor.org slash sample dash exercise dash pop dash ups. Um, and it's a quick little exercise. It shouldn't take, it's just the interview. It shouldn't take you more than like 20 minutes to test making pop-ups in an A to J guided interview. To wrap up today, let's talk about functions. So functions are a way to collect data from the end user. Data is collected from the end user and it is stored in variables. Functions allow you to manipulate that data. Functions are built in actions performed to alter data collected. The format for a function is whatever the name of the function is, parentheses, bracket, name of the variable, close bracket, close parentheses. In our naming convention of variables in our, in our community of document assembly developers, generally there's a space between, between words in a variable name. So variable space name space TE. Whenever there is a space and you are trying to use functions, you have to wrap those functions in brackets and then wrap them in parentheses to ensure that they're working good. So just good practice, use the brackets, use the parentheses with functions. You can use functions in logic. So here as an example of converting someone's date to a number age and then testing whether that age is, is less than 18. So in a, a successful interview, the end user is going to be, need, you're going to need to know what their date of birth is to put on the form or whatever to fill in the information. But you also need to know if they're 18 or older because this, is, this form is only supposed to be used by adults. So instead of asking someone, are you 18? And if they are 18, then asking them their birth date, you just ask everybody their birth date and use the function of age to, to convert it and then use logic so that you ask that successful end user whether they're 18 and their birth date all in one question. You can also use functions in question text. So here I'm trying to display to the end user when they have to file a response and I'm using the function date to take their notice date, add 30 actual days to it, and then convert that to a date to give them, uh, instead of saying you must file a response within 30 days of your notice, instead I can just say you have to file a response by August 31st. And it's an easy way to give the end user the information they need without making them do the actual extra work of looking at a calendar and figuring out when 30 days from the notice date was. I already know the notice date. I already know that it's 30 days from that date that the response is required. I can use an easy function to convert that to the end user in a way in which they would much prefer and make them not have to do the, the math. 
So this is the age one that I talked about before. It converts a date to age in years. And the syntax is age, and then parentheses brackets, the, vari the date variable, close brackets, close parentheses. These functions are also available on our website under the Learn section in the A to J Authoring Guide. We have a list of all the functions we support and how to use them in your interview as well. So um, that's under the Question Design section. But date is another one that I've showed you here. So it converts a day into a month, month, day, day, year, 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 year format. So the syntax again is date, all caps, parentheses, brackets, date variable, close parentheses. You can do math if you want, like adding 30 days here, close parentheses. Today is one that is used a lot by end users or by authors. So this returns today's date. You never know what day your end user is going to be running the interview and you don't want to have to keep coming back to edit like, you know, when it rolls into 2023, you don't have to go back and edit it on January 1st or 2nd to make sure that um, any calculations based on a year or a date are correct still in the new year. Just use today. And so whenever it is run in the A to J viewer, A to J knows what day it is um, programmatically. And so you could use that using the function today to do calculations. You can also use it as minimum or maximum delimiters on a calendar. So if you have a field where you're asking for a date and you don't want to show them any days in the past, use today as the minimum. If you don't want to show them any days in the future, use today as the maximum. And then the calendar will not, and the date field will not let them enter days that are in the past or the future, whatever the limit is set. So today is very useful in both logic and in fields. Has answered returns a true false value if a variable has a value. So it returns a true if it has a value, false if it doesn't. Has answered uh, is commonly used for testing if an end user has a middle name. If you're creating a combination variable of like client full name TE, you want to test if they have a middle name so that you don't have a weird extra blank space in the middle of their name. Because if they don't have a middle name and you just have sent cl set client full name to first plus middle plus last, you're going to have an extra space. So it's going to be first space 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 last. If you test using has answered for middle name and instead use the logic in the screenshot below where it sets full name to just first plus space plus last, if they do not have a middle name, um, that'll just make a cleaner end result for client full name. But it can test for any variable if it has been answered by the end user. Contains is one that we made a couple of years ago based on an author request. They wanted, uh, this organization wanted to test whether a variable contained a specific value and then wanted to do something with that. Um, so it evaluates whether a variable contains a specific text string. And it's a little bit different than our other ones. So it's contains, parentheses, bracket, variable name, close bracket, then a comma, and then some value in quotes, close parentheses. So it's testing whether value, whatever you put in between the quotes, that string is contained inside of variable name. And if it is, um, it will uh, return a true, that it does contain it or does not contain it, a false if it doesn't contain it. Um, so if contains, and the variable is legal problem TE, if it has the word violence, so I asked a question like, what's your legal problem? And if something said violence or um, hit or pain or some, whatever, some, whatever would trigger a, um, a follow-up question about that. So if, in this example, if legal problem TE contains violence, I want to go to a follow-up question that would have some information about domestic abuse. The other, another function is ordinal. Um, ordinal returns the ordinal form of a number. So you usually use this on a repeat loop on their counting variable. So instead of saying, um, what is your next asset? What is the asset? You're like keep saying next. You can say first, second, third, 75th, whatever it is. Um, so use the ordinal and then uh, the variable. My variable here in the syntax doesn't have a space in it. So I didn't actually need brackets. Probably should include those just for best practices. But this does return the ordinal form. So it's in a repeat loop, what is your first child's name? Um, you know, Sally. Then you can ask about Sally and Sally's birth date and whatever. And the next time through the loop, you can say, what is Bobby's birth date? And then, you know, or what is your second child's birth date? Um, the second child's name. And then what is Bobby's birth date? And so on. So anyway, this returns the ordinal function or the ordinal form of a, a number. Sum is the last one we'll talk about today. 
sum returns the total value of all the values held by a repeating variable. So you've asked the end user for their monthly expenses one at a time in a repeat loop, and then you uh, add that up, you sum the value of that, and it will give you, you wanna set total expenses to sum of expense and you. So this lets you do some math to set a new variable, potentially total expenses. Then you can use it to say like your total of your monthly expenses is $1,600. Is that correct? They can either say yes or no. And based on the answer, you can go back and correct the values they told you about before, add to them, delete from them, whatever, or move on to the next set of questions. Just a couple of reminders then for syntax and additional resources. The function names are wrapped with variables. You wrap the variable, excuse me, the function name, and then you wrap the variable with brackets and parentheses. And you can use both a function and a macro if you want to display whatever value has been converted um, using the function. You can wrap it in a macro and display it to the end user. So if I wanted to say client total assets and you convert it to a dollar amount, um, and then display it back to the end user, I can use the macro by wrapping, I can do that by wrapping the function in a macro as well. All of the functions, as I mentioned, are on our website under adajauthor.org slash functions. And if you want to practice your things you've learned from uh, about macros and functions today, we have sample exercises specifically devoted to those small portions. Again, just like the pop-ups one, they're like 20 minutes long and we'll um, just run you through how to make uh, an ex sample exercise with macros and a sample exercise using functions. Just to get your feet wet if you don't have an actual project you're working on today, uh, go ahead and, and do that. Our next webinar is June 2nd of this year at 11 a.m., so the first Thursday of next month. You are all registered because you signed up for the series, uh, the 2022 series. If you have anything you want featured in that webinar, or if you have any questions, you can uh, let me know. And I'd love to do, do it more on something that you're looking for specifically. So every month I, I work on coming up with different ideas for our, our next webinar. But if there's something specifically that you want, please reach out to me. My email is jessica at uh, cali.org. Love to hear about it. Thank you for attending and I will see you all uh, next month.